Pontefract Road, Ackworth. This is actually my work colleague's uh, brother. I, I did know that there was open to, to build on there, but I haven't discussed anything at all with him. I've got a form, it said I've done it. Sorry, I can't hear you. Just take a minute, whatever you want to take yourself out for that. Right, okay. <coughs> Is that a voting or discussion? A voting? Right, thank you. And then item four, is it apologies for absence? Uh, Council Williams and Council Swain. And then item five is to approve the correct record of minutes of the meeting of the Pine Highways Committee held on the 10th of February, pages 1 to 4. Do we have those moved? Will and Chair. Seconded, Chair. In favour? Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Agenda item six is our planning applications. Our first one is a residential development of 61 dwellings, South Hemsworth and South Kirby, and Ruth that will be presented up for sale. Thank you, Chair. So this application is seeking planning consent for 61 dwellings on land that was previously used as fireworks and training is currently vacant. The site currently comprises reclaimed grasslands with a few areas of hard standing remaining. I'll just take you through a few slides. So the application site boundary is outlined in red on this site. Um, this is the adjacent housing that's been built um, recently, as I was saying, in the developer. Photographs came to view. Uh, so the first one is the junction of Broad Lane and the junction into that residential development to the east of the site. Um, the second is a view towards the boundary, a uh, view from within the adjacent housing site. The third view is looking east along Broad Lane from the proposed access point, and view four is looking north into the application site. Number five is a view along the site boundary from just outside um, the red line uh, from Broad Lane, so looking along the hedgerow. And view six is looking west along Broad Lane, where you can see the new dwellings built on the right hand side. Again, the application site boundary outlined in red with the neighbouring uh, housing development to the east. Um, north of the application site is the Northway Business Park um, and land. To the west of the site is employment land allocated to employment land, um, and south of the Broad Lane is Greenville land. This is the proposed site layout. So there's one access point 
uh, into the site here. Um, the, the houses that front onto Broadway and also have driveway access, um, and then just a route through the site towards the north where the attenuation pond and then and landscape into the coast. There are highway improvements off site proposed as part of this development. Uh, so there will be a footpath provided along the frontage of the site, which you can see here, and these are the access points for the driveways for the dwellings fronting onto Broad Lane. Um, there will be a slight widening of Broad Lane, which is the band that you can see in pink there. Uh, um, some lining works um, and the contours of the carriageway just shown on this um, plan here. So this is a site access point. Um, and the road will be widened and white lines provided. Just to make samples of the house types throughout the development, so this is a typical semi detached house type, so a three bed um, lounge, dining kitchen on the ground floor, three bedrooms, uh, and a bathroom on the first floor. A typical detached house type, and the house types are um, similar uh, to the ones that are on the adjacent site, it's the same development. Um, and a typical detached house type. This one is a three bed. Proposed site layout again, and this is just um, the layout superimposed onto the aerial photograph. And this is the adjacent employment land, so we do have an ongoing application on this site for commercial use. So the application site is allocated as part of that employment use. Uh, in the local plan, and the site is outside below the settlement boundary. The proposed use for housing would be a departure from the development plan. The applicant submitted supporting information which states that the site has been allocated for employment use for approximately 18 years and has not come forward for development. They've also identified a number of plots within Lathwaite Grange um, that remain undeveloped, which amount to around 27,000 square metres of floor area. And the council is also considering the current application adjacent to the site, which is the one that you can see there on the photograph. And that also is up to 27,000 square metres, and that would be a mix of um, E class uses suitable for a residential area, B2, which is general industrial and BA storage and distribution. So based on the information submitted, it's considered that the departure from the current development plan is justified and the principle of residential development is acceptable. It's worth noting that the application site is a proposed housing allocation in the emerging local plan, however no way can be afforded to that this current time. Although the site is located outside the settlement boundary, it is considered to be in a sustainable location with bus stops approximately 500 metres to the east and a range of local services and employment opportunities available in the local area. The proposals include works to improve the highway along the site frontage, which would include, increase the width of Broad Lane and provide a footpath along the site frontage, which leads to the existing footpath to the east. Subject to conditions to secure site highway works, site lines and surfacing, no objections have been raised by the Council's highway section. The development will provide a mix of two, three and four bed dwellings, which would meet the guidance in the adopted residential design guide in terms of the space between the proposed dwellings and in relation to the existing dwellings to the east. The appropriate levels of amenity space will be provided commensurate with the scale of dwelling and parking that will be provided in the province of the street design guide. There's a policy requirement for the provision of affordable housing, unless this can be demonstrated not to be viable. Supporting information has been submitted and independently assessed on behalf of the Council, which demonstrates the contribution to affordable housing would be unviable and prevent the development proceeding. Based on the developer profit of 15%, approximately 100,000 could be available for contributions towards public open space improvements or bus infrastructure, for example. However, the advice provided to the Council by CP Viability is that in this instance, a developer profit of 20% is reasonable and meets with the National Planning Practice Guidance. And on this basis, the only viable contribution would be for biodiversity net gain, which amounts to approximately £6,500. In terms of biodiversity, boundary trees and hedgerows will be retained with the exception of 
trees along the side frontage and tree to the eastern boundary. It's considered the retained planting wouldn't have a detrimental impact on future residents and the condition requiring the submission of a detailed landscaping scheme and a management plan is recommended. Landscaping plan submitted the application proposed planting four trees along the site frontage uh, together with tree planting across the development and in the area around the detention basin to the north of the development. Enhancements to the existing hedgerows should also be provided with any submitted landscaping scheme. Given the sites located adjacent, adjacent to employment land, mitigation against noise has been considered by environmental health and they're satisfied that future residents could be protected from noise through the use of acoustic fencing and mitigation measures within the dwellings to the west and south of the development, comprising mechanical ventilation and double glazing. The submitted tree report states acoustic fencing could be installed without damage to the retained planting. An ecological impact assessment has been submitted, which makes a number of recommendations, including provision of bat and bird boxes, enhancements for hedgehogs, and improvements to the existing hedgerows. The biodiversity metric has also been submitted, following comments on West Yorkshire Ecology, which identifies a loss of biodiversity on site as a result of the development, which would be offset through a contribution to off site enhancements. This will be secured by Section 106 legal agreements, which your members will now need to approve the application. Other material considerations are detailed within the agenda. No objections are raised by statutory consultees, subject to conditions and informatives set out in the report. It's considered the proposed development accords with relevant policy and guidance, and approval is recommended. If members are minded to resolve to approve planning permission, please advise that members delegate the final wording of the planning conditions and legal agreement to the Chair and Vice Chair of the Planning and Highway Committee and the Council's Service Director for Planning and Highway. Thank you, Chair. We are one speaker registered, uh, Ellen Manson. You've got three minutes now, and I'm going to get down to 30 seconds to work. Good morning, Chair and Members. My name is Helen Ransom, Land Director for Gleason Homes West Yorkshire. As Members are aware, Gleason specialises in the provision of entry-level housing aimed at first-time buyers, giving customers at the lower end of the housing market the chance to afford to buy their own home. We are currently developing 70-plus such sites across the north of England, including our long-standing development at Pontefract Road, Ferry Bridge. The proposal before you today is for the development of 61 such homes at Broad Lane on land adjacent to a former Gleason scheme that completed in 2019. We take special care in determining selling prices that are affordable to as much of the local market as possible. On this development, we anticipate, the de on this development, we anticipate that the majority of properties will be affordable to a full time working couple on the minimum wage. Buying Gleason homes is often significantly cheaper than private rent and often much more cost effective than renting even a local authority home. Gleason are all about home ownership. We do not sell to private landlords and all market sale contracts include a no rental covenant for a period of five years without our express permission. Reviewing statistics across our live site at Ferrybridge and two former Gleason developments at School Street Upton and the former site at Broad Lane, we have sold over 450 homes to first time buyers making up 81% of the total homes sold on these developments. Furthermore, our previous development at Broad Lane sold 34% of properties to those living with family members and 48% to those living in rented accommodation, showing our commitment to home ownership and helping people to escape the rental trap. Following the pandemic, police are also determined to focus on selling to key workers who have done so much to help this country through the emergency. It is our intention going forward to prioritise these people and we have rolled out several initiatives to achieve this. Our hope is that going forward we continue to sell two thirds of our properties to key workers. We will also be rolling out our Community Matters initiative over this scheme and through this programme Gleason are happy to commit in a number of initiatives in order to embed ourselves within local communities in which we developed. This will include matters such as local junior sports sponsorship, employment commitments, commitment to apprenticeships and sustainability pledges. Finally, we would like to thank the Council's officers and members for your time today and for taking this application forward. Thank you. Are there any questions? Councillor Good morning. I'm just looking through the 
flooding part of it uh, on our paperwork on page 43. Um, I know we're in, in a flood risk zone, but the more we actually build on these, this land, um, it's got nowhere to soak away. Now, they're saying that the rivers and anything, there's nowhere near there to get any you know, flooding from rivers, but the heavy rainfalls, what we have lately, uh, it, it's quite significant. And I know you said you've got a, is it a, an attenuation pond on the site, but is there anything else you can do to alleviate any flooding in this area? Thank you. So just to answer the question, um, when we um, assess the size of the attenuation basin, it takes into account climate change as well. So the built into the calculation is already um, storage for a storm event, the significant storm event like you're describing, but also an uplift for climate change. So that's built into our calculations. Um, the rate of discharge as well is restricted, so when it does rain, the purpose of the basin really is that that will fill up and it won't all flood out into, um, yeah, it will store it in there and hold it back and then discharge it at a controlled rate. Okay. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, and where's that, sorry? Is that with the attenuation pond at the back of the estate? Yeah, so the attenuation pond is at the back of the development and then that will discharge into a controlled rate into um, a ditch that's at the back of the site. The back of the site. Um, you can just about see on the top of that plan. Um, it'll discharge into there, but like I say, the basin will, will restrict it and hold it back um, and accounts for that climate change and um, storm events, that are these freak events that we have. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. It's very nice to know that the developers speaking of the proper housing in the district, and we all know that we could have a different definition of uh, housing affordability. In our situation, at the moment, it would be 60% below the average income. So, can I just ask you what is the average cost of the homes that you uh, would build in the area? And then we will be able to assess. That is what percentage you have claimed to say that you Yeah, so we're just working on our pricing strategy at the moment, so I'm not 100% sure um, what we'll end up with on this development. But when I say the majority will be sold to a, a full time couple on the minimum wage, the a full time couple could afford a property that's 176000 so that's what a full time couple on the minimum wage can afford. So we anticipate the majority of our properties, and I think. Probably looking at about three quarters of them probably being um, below that figure. Hopefully that helps. Um, sorry, I can't answer it directly at this stage. Any other questions? Councillor Scott? Yeah, I've got a little bit of concern about parking because there's hardly any garages for anybody. I know there's garage space for some, some of the houses, but for the majority, there's no garage space. There's parking space. There's uh, and if two people are working, then there's two cars and they've got visitors. And I just worry about where people are going to be able to park because the, there's a lot of houses crammed into that site, small houses. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of parking for people. We are compliant with parking standards, um, both for visitors and um, residents. So I don't know if you would say any more on that. Yeah, as Helen, as Helen said, the, um, the parking that's been provided on site is in accordance with Wakefield's parking standards. So um, there's 130 parking spaces across the site, which is the equivalent of just over two per um, dwelling. Um, as I say, that's in, in accordance with the parking standards and it is representative of car ownership across um, Wakefield area as well. So um, it's been demonstrated in the transport statement that the parking standards um, have been met. Thank you. I, I just worry about the size of the houses because a lot of them are very small 
uh, the two and three bedrooms, the third bedroom will be a box room more than likely. And, um, and then there's not much parking space, there's no garages or very few garages except for your four bedroom ones. Uh, so I just think that, I just worry about the size of the houses and no parking facilities for people, no garages. So there is other garages in addition to those to the far beds. Um, I haven't I haven't counted them, so I don't know how many there is, but I don't know if you can zoom in on that plan at all, no. Uh, there are other um, there are other properties with garages, actually quite a lot do have them. Um, in terms of the size of the properties, um, this is the same range of properties that we are selling um, at Fenbridge and sold on previous broad lane and Upton developments. Um, we know that they're really popular, um, we've enjoyed success selling these properties um, and they do meet our target market um, of what they're looking for. You know, most of our um, purchasers we anticipate will move out of rented accommodation or move out from living with their parents as first time buyers. Um, so it's a really great entry level um, property for them um, and that, that's why we've gone with a majority two and three bed um, mix because that's who buys on our, on our typical developments. Thank you. Jones. Thanks, Chair. Uh, with regards to the Section 810, which is obviously mitigating and adapting to climate change, you know, as this uh, development, if, if it is passed, would obviously be completed very quickly, getting quite near to 2030, and obviously the government's requirements about electric cars. Is there anything in the infrastructure for this estate, if this is passed, that will be able to provide charging places for, for the residents, particularly as Councillor Scott pointed out about you know, the difficulty with the parking and, and so forth, and therefore potentially creating problems in the future. So in terms of future proofing, is there anything within the infrastructure of that state that will take account of providing those charging units for cars? Thanks, Jane. Yeah, so um, assuming everything, uh, today we are going through the process now understanding uh, requirements in the future for future proofing developments. It may be that a substation or something like that may be required in order to provide for the future of how we generate our energy. Um, so that, that process is, is undergoing at the moment. Um, obviously all properties will have power charging points um, and a number of these properties will, um, due to the timing, um, end up with um, air source heat pumps because the new building regulations are due to come in probably when this um, is underway. So quite a number of these properties will actually have air source heat pumps rather than gas boilers um, based on the new building regulations that, that kick, kick in in June 2023. So next year. Councillor <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Just following on from that then. So are you telling me that these properties have got the electric uh, car charging points for electric vehicles and uh, is there any solar panels or anything like that for and did you just say that this one is going to be uh, water pump heating or your future buildings? And then I just got another one after that. Okay. So in terms of the car charging, it's a condition on this development um, regarding car charging points. So that will obviously be picked up um, regarding the specifications through a condition discharge application. Um, in terms of your other question, the building regulations will probably kick in about halfway through this development. So not all the properties will have um, air source heat pumps because we'll be building to the old standards. But as soon as the new building regulations come in, it's any dwellings from um, June next year. Um, we'll have to have um, more energy efficient solutions and the solution that we are designing um, is air source heat pumps. In terms of solar panels, um, we've assessed a number of options um, for energy. Um, unfortunately, solar panels isn't the most effective um, on our particular types of properties. It's the air source heat pumps that achieve the best carbon saving um, and that's why we've gone with that solution. It's did I answer everything? I can't. Yeah, uh, it would have been good if you'd have done all the properties from start to finish with it. It's yeah, we're led by building regulations, so the first, the first um, half until that kicks in will follow the current regs, and then when the new regs start, we'll follow those. Okay. And then, thank you. The other part of it was the the pathway um, roof. If you can put view three or view six up. 
the pathway from this estate down where they're going to walk to. But when you photos, there. Uh, where, where is the entrance on there for, for this estate? Is it on my left or right? So this is that, that's a good one there, number three. Um, is that where you are going to do the new pathway down from the estate? And how wide will it be? And is there a ditch in between them bushes and that green area there? Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure. If, yeah. Well, is it the, the estate's going to be on this side or other side, isn't it? There. The estate's on that side. Yeah. So the path will go here. The path will go down and there. Link to the other housing. Will it, will it match up with the other housing estate that's down there to start with? So it won't just cut off. Yeah. So the, the full length from the entrance of the the new build right down to the houses that's there now. Yeah, the footway that's been provided will be two metres wide, which is um, generally the requirement of most local authorities now, and it gives adequate uh, width for pedestrians walking side by side with the buggy as well. Yeah. Um, and it will tie into the existing footway along the remainder of uh, Broad Lane as well. I think it does actually provide um, some additional width as well, so it's actually widening the existing footway rather than um, tying into the existing width as well. Will there be any footpath going from... The other way, not down to the houses, but the other way. The the footpath extends along the boundary of the site, um, but it does stop when it gets to the boundary of um, the western boundary of the site. Obviously, the nature of Broad Lane as it continues to the west and um, becomes more rural, yeah. um, and it's a less desirable route for pedestrians who are seeking facilities. Um, and especially given the the length of Broad Lane to the west, you're looking about um, two kilometres to get to I think it's Common Road. Yeah. Whereas to the east, it's about 1.2 kilometres to get into South Elmsall and the faci facilities that are provided there. Um, so it is likely that the majority of uh, pedestrians will walk to the east of the facilities. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Councillor Tanky. Uh, thank you, Chair. Apologies if I've missed this, and it, it leads on to what Councillor Blazard's asked. Uh, the development, is there some houses on the front or do you actually have to drive into the development to uh, access the houses? You know, like the, like the development next door, there is some on the front in there. Because my concern is about the, the width of the road mm. there and if they've got visitors coming and there's no car parking spaces at the front, that's where I can encounter problems. Yeah, so the driveways that front onto Broad Lane have been designed so um, residents can have the option to drive in or reverse in safely. Um, there's adequate width along Broad Lane as a result of the widening scheme um, that will allow a car to safely access and egress the car parking spaces. Um, the, the way the car parking standards work are the, the designed to accommodate um, an adequate number of cars that can park De um, dependent on the scale of the building and the plot types. So the plots along the front, they're provided with two car parking spaces um, under some garages as well. Um, so there should be adequate space for visitors and residents to park on there as well. So there's some at the front there? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, on that plan, um, you can see the sort of pale beige, um, they're the entrances into the driveway, so I think one, two, three, four, six yeah. properties um, are accessed from Broad Lane. And the pink line, that's some of the widening works. Thank you. Any other questions? Dr Scott? Looking at public transport, where's the nearest bus stop for people to get to? So the nearest bus stop is approximately 500 metres to the east of the development, so it's roughly about a five minute walk from the site. Right, and, and would you consider then uh, funding um, a permit for the first 12 months for everybody, for every household? It's not been um, included as part of um, negotiations with the council. Um, in terms of the development, we will have um, a travel plan on this development. 
um, which will obviously tell people where the local buses are and encourage them to use them and include sort of journey planning tools and vouchers and things like that to encourage people to use public transport and car share and things like that. So you, so you would fund vouchers then for people? I would have to review, um, obviously, more information about the cost because of the viability and everything. I'm not sure if it was assessed under that or, or requested. Um, Ruth, I don't know if you've got any information on that. There is, there is a bus route, just as we drove up on Tuesday. When you get to the, the, the build next door, it's just a bit further than that bus. Don't go down that road and it goes off into the state. It so, goes into the state? So we don't come down that lane at all? No, we don't come down that Okay. Oh, we're just going to ask them for a bus stop, that we're all. <laughs> yeah. no, bus don't come down. Where the turn off is, not the first one, just come in. I think there's one just past that, but there where Ruth is now. Yeah. And it goes down that lane. So when we're saying five minutes, it's five minutes to the front, but how yeah, long will it take? It's not even five minutes for that, for that long past us. Right. <laughs> well, no. If I run it, <laughs> yeah. Right, thank you. But but would you still look at funding permits? I've just had a double check in here, um, and, it, and it was um, noted um, by the West Yorkshire Combined Authority, but it was assessed as part of the viability assessment. <coughs> so obviously, it, it was considered that only the contribution towards the um, net gain factor um, to make the scheme viable. So what you're saying, it's not viable? The at, at the moment, the scheme is only viable to afford that 6,700 and, um, I can't remember the exact figure, but approximately, um, that figure and that's what we, we've agreed with officers. Um, obviously, you know, if it's something that members were minded to attach to the scheme, we'd have to review that with officers separately. Um, but the scheme has already gone through a viability taking account of that request. Right. I feel sorry for sharing all this, not looking at me. <laughs> Any further questions? No? Thank you. Uh, next one, it would have been Councillor Collins, who was unfortunately not able to come today, and I think you've all got um, a statement that you've all got. Thank you, Chair. Sure, Councillor Collins can't make it today. Uh, members, you've all got a copy of what she sent to her, but I'll leave it for the benefit of everybody else that's in attendance. As local councillors, myself and Councillor Tully do not object to development. You will have seen the swathes of development that we have had over recent years, in particular for road lane area. We have welcomed development and improvements with open arms. The fact of the matter now is that the infrastructure can no longer come up with the capacity of we have to know. Road lane is a very narrow road, but they've seen a number of fatalities over time. And until a time, until a time in which this road is made safer, wider with better access to both ends of the board, we would not be approving any more development. We need to stop the cycle of building first and dealing with issues later. There are no footpaths on the road lane. Quite simply, there will be more pollution for our area without making sure the corner is used for purpose. Regardless of the report, the road in practical terms cannot take more traffic in its current state. We have brownfield sites all over the area and these should be considered first. There will be a loss of habitat and environmental implications if we to approve the application. To conclude, both myself and councillors consider this site to be unsuitable for further development until infrastructure can support it. GP appointments in schools are already oversubscribed, and this will add further pressure to the area. We should focus on improving the infrastructure first and make some different purpose before approving any more schemes. Thank you. I think so, Councillor Collins isn't here to, to question on that one, so I'm going to leave it at that one. Are there any questions to officers? Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Ruth, just want to know, um, agenda page 12 and 13, exactly how many letters of objection and support you have received in total? Because here we've got a list of the reasons why 
is that, you know, what is and that's the day of jet, but exactly how many measures we have received of this application. 16 matters of objections. Does it indicate in the before the 16 objections and one, one letter of support and one new one So given the fact that we have 16 letter of uh, objection, um, if we are mindful, the committee might not approve it today, is there any uh, further consultation or from the council point of view to explain to the residents why this has been approved? Yeah. All the um, matters raised are all have all been addressed in the uh, assessment, um, so there, there's no further consultation after this. Councillor Jones. Thanks, Chair. I apologise for not being able to this point, but these two questions are on the last step, sorry. But going back to the, the issue about the car challenging, I know I'm out of the to ask the question on purpose, but going back on the point now on agenda page 59 and point 15, which is under the conditions, it's just sort of curious as to why it comes in as a condition at the end rather than part of the infrastructure, whereby you're sort of saying that the development shall not be occupied until the speed of the directive vehicle charging points, etc. etc. has been has been submitted. I'm just wondering now why it is that that's not included in the in the, the Planning documents, you know, as part of the normal procedures, you know, to take account of the fact that this development will be getting pretty well near to 2030 and so forth. And, you know, why that isn't there now, so that, you know, we are then, you know, we do know what, you know, what the, the if you like, the, the structure is going to be because it's part of the planning process. That, that's the first question. The second one is on page, agenda page 17. Uh, and this comes about my other responsibilities in council, which is the child care sufficiency assessment, uh, which I would be part of my committee work each year. And I'm curious as to why is there an assumption, firstly, that this development, because it's, it's, a, it's the start of it, won't be children of, if you like, full time, uh, full time school age, i.e., above the age of five. And also, given the fact that that's the 2020 assessment and there's been one for 2021. Thanks, Chair. So, in terms of the electric charging points, um, I think that it's a fairly standard infrastructure um, and it is a standard condition to apply that um, so that the details come in. At that stage, and prior to any houses being occupied, it's not something that we particularly require the details for as part of the planning application. Um, and the children's places, we have had confirmation from education that there's no requirement for school places um, at any level, so junior school, and high school, post 16, or childcare. So we have had confirmation from family services that that's the case for this development. Okay. Uh, um, on this application, CIL is not available to make any contribution to the lack of amenities highlighted by Council of Commons in a letter. I'm concerned about the access onto the broad lane. Uh, it seems very inadequate uh, for extra traffic. Uh, I'm conscious of the uh, lack of place, school places and medical facilities. There is a miserly S106 agreement for £6,000. Is there a, some reason why uh, a 106 cannot be applied for the provision of education and addressing the highway problem? Or is it a disinclination by the developer? So they are making improvements to the highway and that will be conditioned. So those works that were shown um, to make improvements to the roadway in front of the application site will be made um, and that is subject to the condition. Um, and as I've just explained to Councillor Jones, that education haven't indicated that there's a shortfall in places in this area as a result of this development. So that a contribution hasn't been asked for for school places. So it's not that there's a disinclination to make a contribution, it's just that 
they are doing the works to the highway um, and they have been requested to make an education contribution um, and notwithstanding that, that will be covered by SIL um, and that is a, a decision for um, Cabinet to make in terms of where any SIL contributions are allocated and they can go to education, that decision is made outside the planning process. I don't, I don't think that that small section of highway work on Broad Lane will solve the highway problem that is going to develop on Broad Lane, the, the full length of Broad And I'm still concerned that is there a legal reason why a 106 cannot be applied to address the lack of uh, a contribution to education because the lack of school places is another really important consideration. Is it really legally not possible? Um, education contributions are covered by civil contributions now. Um, so unless it's in the local plan application, so a certain size and district do have um, the ability to ask for an education contribution. So some of the developments that you've seen in city fields, for instance, um, in the allocation for that special policy area, um, there is provision for primary school places, so we can ask for contributions from developers where it's in the allocation. Um, for this site, it will just be covered by so. Any further questions? Councillor Scott? Yeah, on page 16, it talks about what I've just been mentioning about uh, a contribution towards. Um, Public transport with West Yorkshire Combined Authority have stated that, and they're asking for uh, bus stops, two bus stops, and contribution towards um, a sustainable travel. Is that not possible to be able to put it into a condition? I know that uh, funding is being looked at, but I just think this is really important to try and sustain people to be able to go on a bus. and they've demonstrated um, that it's not, be it, not viable to make any contributions to um, local public transport infrastructure or the provision of uh, uh, bus passes for example to the local residents and, and as Helen said um, there is a travel plan so there will be sort of details <coughs> provided of the local bus services and alternatives such as cycling and footpath routes uh, that, it's not been shown to be viable to uh, make a contribution to improve the existing bus stops of the metro cars. I don't want to Any further questions? No? I don't have a to The Office of Recommendations for Approval, do I have that moved? Move it, Chair. Seconded? Seconded, Chair. In favour? Against? Abstentions? And that is carried. Uh, we will just have, with all the conditions that we've gone through today, we will just have a two minute break while we change our office.
Right. Uh, agenda item number two is a single story extension at South Lemsel. This is coming before you today as you will realise it is a fellow councillor, otherwise it wouldn't be here to be delegated, but I'll transfer the same to So over to Fiona. So item two it is a household application for single store extension to the side of a semi-detached dwelling at Lump and Dennis Avenue in South Emsall. The site occupies a prominent corner plot with rear facing um, gardens onto Minnesota Lane and the size area around the side. Here is the photo of the site taken from the Dennis Avenue where members visited it from at the site visit on Tuesday. So these are the proposed elevations of the floor plans. The extension would project four metres to the side of the dwelling. It is eight metres in length along the full side elevation of the property and is 3.7 metres in height to the ridge line. It would create a ground floor bedroom with ensuite bathroom for the property. And here is the site plan showing the existing house, the extension and the remaining garden and parking to the side. So as Chair advised, the application is presented to committee in accordance with the agreed scheme of delegation as it relates to a council's property. The proposal meets all local policy requirements in terms of scale, overlooking, overshadowing and appearance and would not conflict with the guidance contained within the adopted residential design guide. Conditions are recommended requiring construction materials to match the existing as closely as possible and to provide the revised parking provision before the development is first occupied. The proposal is considered acceptable and therefore approval is recommended. Thank you. And any questions for Fiona? No. Go on, Councillor. I have got a problem with this. It's got parking spaces, it's got you know, spread garden space as well. I can't see any problem with that. Thank you. Councillor Harvey? Yeah, thank you. Very quickly, you can ask whether these proposed uh, proposal or extension have any sort of an increased effect on the surrounding area. No, because of the scale of it, um, as obviously we don't think it'll have any significant effect. It's subordinate to the existing dwelling, and given the size of the plot, I think it'll sit quite nicely within the parameters of the plot. Other questions, I, I think mine's a comment. Does it matter? Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Because we did notice when we went on the site visit, there was a property uh, at the other entrance, uh, the opposite side to the entrance. What has dad uh, an extension? So I, I just think it's in keeping with, with the properties around it. Uh, the officer recommendation is for approval to have it moved. Moved it. Seconded. Second. In favour? That is carried. Thank you very much. Agenda item three is an extra work attached to it at Fairy Curtains Backwards and Fiona will do the presentation. Road and shared with the existing property. 
The new driveway to the proposed dwelling will follow a similar alignment to the path that currently leads to the tennis court. This shows the um, existing greenhouse down here, an existing outbuilding, and the sheds retained here to the west of the gazebo. The dwelling comprises a large bungalow with an accommodation over one floor. Here are the rear and side elevations that would face onto Pontefract Road. It is of modern design, so here's the front elevation and the other side, which has large glazed walls facing onto the main garden space. Here's the floor plan with accommodation comprising three ensuite bedrooms with master dressing room, office, triple integral garage with staircase access to the room space for storage outlined in red. Beyond the hallway is the kitchen, utility, living and dining space and a snooker room with bar. So the site is located within the green belt. The red star here indicates the oops, wait. <laughs> don't keep touching it. Uh, that indicates where the proposed dwelling will be sited. The settlement of high output is to the south, and the green shading shows the extent of the green belt. So Ward Council Garbage's obviously support of the scheme and has requested the application to consider by members today. As detailed within the report, the most up-to-date policies and guidance for development in this location is provided by the National Planning Policy Framework. This includes paragraph 149, which states that the construction of new buildings should be regarded as inappropriate. An exception to this would be partial redevelopment of previously developed land, where the development would not have a greater impact on openness of the green belt and the purposes of including land within it in the existing development. Whilst this proposal could be considered to constitute redevelopment of a previously developed site, it is considered that the dwelling and associated paraphernalia would have a greater impact on openness than the tennis court and landscape garden and would not assist the purpose of safeguarding the countryside from encroachment. The new, new building would therefore be defined as inappropriate and it is considered by officers that no very special circumstances have been put forward by the applicant to outweigh the harm of this inappropriate development would cause to this green belt location. The report also provides a detailed assessment of all other considerations, including highway safety, design, layout and landscaping, amenity, security, drainage, sustainable construction, trees, and biodiversity. Other than the concerns and requests for additional survey raised by the Arboreal Cultural Officer, no objections have been raised by consultees and subject to conditions the proposal would be considered acceptable in regard to these other considerations. However, this is not considered to overcome the harm that this has been that has been demonstrated and will be caused to the openness of the green belt. The proposal is considered inappropriate in principle and the long-term harm to the green belt could not be mitigated or reversed. The officer recommendation is therefore if you all these grounds. Thank you. We have one speaker registered, uh, Mr. Gonzalo. Uh, you've got three minutes and we'll remind you when he gets 30 seconds, so when you're ready. Thank you everyone. Um, as I said, I'm Gonzalo. I've been appointed by Mr. and Mrs. Taylor to design their house. Um, as you said, on the, mainly on the uh, existing park standing uh, tennis court. Um, I, I, I'd say that actually this house has very minimal impact, certainly from the main road, which we very probably will see, given the fact that it's actually one story, uh, almost level below. Um, there is an improvement in the biodiversity, as you can see on that plan. We are removing one of the trees because it's dead and it's not safe, but we are planting five, six new trees, uh, besides a lot of other species, green species, flower meadows, etc. Um, the client has lived in this area for 32 years, 12 of them in that, in that house, and the reason why he's uh, appointed us to design the house is uh, the fact that uh, his, his health is deteriorating uh, quite rapidly with Parkinson's. Um, so we've designed the house uh, to cater for his, not only his current needs, but his future needs. Uh, since the, his current house is, is starting to become you know, a hazard, start to be quite unsafe due to a number of reasons main one of them being several level changes inside the house which as you can expect for someone who's, who's starting to suffer with parkinson's is becoming a real a real issue so i i'd ask the members to consider the approval of of the scheme and um, because as we said we, we try to be 
we see it in the architecture. Uh, yes, it's slightly modern, uh, but we believe that you know this this it's, it's mainly on the tennis court, which is you know redundant mainly. Uh, and again, you know, just just it's mostly to uh, to cater for the future needs of the applicant, really, more than anything. Any questions from Councillor Scott? Morning. Um, the, the applicant has not put in any uh, special circumstances, very special circumstances, because it's in Greenbelt. Why did he not include the, his, his ill health within the very special circumstances? Well, to be, to be quite honest, this, for me, it's, 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 it, at the time, was a little bit of a sensitive issue if you, know, if, if you can understand about, you know, talking about this, you know, the, the special circumstance of the person's health and etc. So that's why we, we try not, we, we didn't go for, forward at the time with that because we didn't want to, it's a bit of a, a, an awkward situation for us to, you know, at least for me to to talk about someone's health in, in, that, in, that, in, that, in, that, in that detail. Um, but you know, it's the reason why I'm here today to, to try to explain why we have actually designed the house the way we designed where we designed it. Because what 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 I'm think, what I'm seeing now is that our client is is almost like gradually being forced to probably leave his house, leave his home, because it's just becoming unsafe for them. For him. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, but that really needs to be in black and white in the report, not just said here. That's that's the issue because we need very special circumstances really because it's in Greenbelt. So and that should have been really included in the report. Councillor Scott, that's my question. Councillor Harvey. Uh, just want to know whether there is any plan to redevelop the tennis court. Is there any uh, or try to remove it? Well, well, uh, no. The, the plan is to obviously we looked at the, the you know, you, you only need to go to 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 the to site to to see the level of care that the applicant has for his land, for his garden, for everything is, is everything is very well maintained. Except the, obviously the tennis court is, is not being used and it's probably never going to be used. So the, the the plan was to in order to minimize as much impact we could. Onto onto the green field, and you know there's 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 only less than 200 square meters of, of new hard landscape, and that's just basically to widen the the the, uh, the access. So there's very very minimal loss of the soft landscape, um, and actually there's a gain because as you can see, you know we're planting a lot of you know six new trees, we we we're planting a lot of flower meadows, etc. So. There is the development of the tennis court is you know seem the appropriate solution to to locate the house again to minimize the impact. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, could you tell me what the height of the ridge? What's the highest point of the uh, bungalow, please? Top of my head, actually, I don't. It's around six meters, but from the main road, you probably won't even see it uh, because as you as you enter the site, then then you you go down to the tennis court by a, almost like a story. So the ridge of the of the roof might be seen from the main road. Uh, very much doubt with with the, with the obviously the retained uh, stonework wall and big tall green hedges. You probably won't even see it. Also, there's. There's quite a lot of uh, uh, landscape and mature trees at the front, which are not going to be uh, going to be untouched. Other questions? Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the trees, what are you going to replant? Uh, are they going to be saplings, or are they going to be, uh, you know, a, a mature, substantial tree? Well, quite frankly, I, I, I don't know. I don't know the, the answer to that, but uh, I, I guess we could, we could deal with that as a matter of condition. But given the fact that the um, the client has got quite a, a lot of interest in terms of maintaining the property and fields and etc., like I said, you only need to go to understand, you know, the level of care. I 
think he'll do whatever needs to be done to um, to make sure your peace is really. Okay. Uh, I did go to say I did see it. Uh, it is a well maintained uh, piece of land. Yeah, I agree with that. The bungalow, what you've designed, is going no further than what the um, tennis courts is there already. Is it? it? It's not going anymore onto the green belt or anything. It's just no, not at all. Not at all. It was it was designed to uh, maintain and keep as many features. There's also a really nice surrounding the, the tennis court, a nice brick wall, brick yeah. work wall. Which again, we, we, we took in cons we considered in terms of the materials we're using the same type of brick, which is a very nice, almost like handmade brick, uh, nice in texture. We're using a, a nicer bond to, to match that that wall. But yes, the house is, is mainly on the tennis court. Um, we've supplied a plan that actually shows the previous uh, hard landscape, the new and the, and the difference, and it's uh, you'll see it's, it's very very minimal, and then we, and it stays exactly on, on that. Uh, because we didn't want to, you know, especially there's a big, huge, uh, nice, beautiful tree in the front, which we didn't want to, to go over that. So it uh, just uh, as on the hard landscape uh, tennis court. And now you've told me about the, the gentleman's ailment. Is the inside of the house, uh, is it all wheelchair friendly? The doors are, are white and sort of wheelchairs and things like that? Correct. So, so the, main, the main thing about the house, one of the main things is obviously no levels. Yes, there is a storage level at the top, but you know that's just storage. You know the applicant's not going to go there. But yeah, the house is all in one story. It's it's wide enough, and big enough to cater for future needs. And um, the, the large and master suite, uh, all, all all of the the bedrooms are on suites with leveled um, uh, threshold uh, toilet. Shower rooms, showers are big enough, so later down the line, if you need a wheelchair to just go in, they'll go in. So there's 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 a lot of thought and care to, to that, and obviously there's there's a garage which is incorporated, which the, at the moment this new, the, the current garage is a few yards away from the house, and as you can imagine, you know it's not ideal, and it will start to isolate the applicant more and more uh, from 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 going out and etc. So that's why we've um, we've designed it. It's got three bedrooms because you know maybe likely in the future someone might have to care full time. So yes, so it's been designed to to cater for all of those needs. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, start. Yeah. How are you going to do it if this gets past today? How are you going to do a border between the bungalow and the house? What? Is it going to be a hedge? Is it going to be a wall? Uh, and and the drive as well to come in and out. So it's, it, I, I don't envisage it to be a wall. I, it's, it's because it would be it would have a big impact. A wall, I think. So it, it definitely is going to be as green as possible. Um, you know, to, to maintain that openness and you know, you know, the beautiful views. You don't want a big wall, I would say. Well, I'm, I'm talking just, you know, I don't know exactly what, what the applicant wants, but I, I very much envisage it's not going to be a wall because that would have a, you know, a negative impact on, on the site. Not as much as a I'm sure it wouldn't want. Um, in terms of in terms of the entrance, what we've done is which we, we we what we're thinking to do is remove the current gate, which is obviously quite close to the highway, further in. So. Any, any car can come off the, 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 the highway very, very quickly. And as you can see, there's quite a, a large area for, to, for a car to congregate, and then you'll have an automatic gate to go to either the new bungalow or the other, the other dwelling. Um, but to the front, we, we're not envisaging anything except, as I said, push that current gate further in. So to maintain and, and, and that, you know, the stone wall and everything, all the green landscape to the front will be untouched. So that's, that's basically what we're trying to do, just again to minimize any impact. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. As you've mentioned, the, the gateway to the property is, is very narrow. Um, we struggle getting, getting the uh, planning bus in. Uh, how do you intend to make deliveries for the building materials to get onto the site? Bear in mind, like you said, that is a very busy, a very busy road. Well, at the moment, as, as I mentioned, we, 
previously, all we're trying to do is, is improve that the gate entrance, and by pushing the gate further in, then you, you're already creating a much like nicer area to away from the traffic, away from the road, to stop and do what you need to do. I mean, we didn't want to do any works in terms of enlargement, in terms of widening the, the gate, because there's of some nice existing uh, stonework uh, pillars that we wanted you know, to leave untouched. So it doesn't change all the, all, any of the character. So bear in mind, like you've just said, that you're hoping to should should this be approved, that you're hoping to widen the gateway. Surely you're going to have to do that before you're going to be able to get any vehicles in to do the building. As, as much as I can appreciate. That you might, you know, find it slightly difficult to, to come in. And um, let me just let me just tell you that all of those grounds are maintained by you know fairly large lorries and, and you know, some small tractors, etc., to, to to serve all of that land. And they don't seem to struggle too much. Yes, it could be wide. It could be wider. It would be. It would improve it. And if we have to do that, we will do so. But currently. The, the, the applicant never had any issue with with with, uh, with all of these you know open you know lorries etc coming going inside so we do, I don't think the applicant sees that as a, as a, as, a, as a problem um, but if we have to do so yes we will do it and we'll do it before if, if necessary as I said and I keep repeating myself the last thing we wanted was to change the character of that beautiful stone work stone wall at the front. And the pillars, we didn't want to touch that because we thought that has a, quite a nice character. And um, yeah, and again, uh, what you don't see in this plan is that at, at the front of the existing house, there's a very, very, very large area of tarmac a drive, uh, which is a lot wider. So it would be, it would have adequate space to create like a, you know, a, a compound for, to build this house. We know, we know. We know real issue really in terms of movement. Okay, thank you. Dr. Taylor. <coughs> I'm sorry, I think you've got all the side visits, but you said that it wouldn't be very uh, visible from the road. Is that area a lot lower than the road? Does it, it, does it sit a lot lower than yes, the road? Yes, correct. You'll see it sits <coughs> two meters minimum below the, below the, below the, the road. Well, below the road, probably even more than that. But uh, as you can see on the on the right side, there's a bit of a green hedge, which is already there, quite mature, which has that little level brickwork wall. And that level above is is actually higher, around a meter and a half from 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 the, from the finished floor level of the house. So yeah, the house from the main road, I, I reckon you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to see it. I mean, we can we can we can we can do some extra drawings in terms of sectional drawings to show that, but I don't think you'd see it. Any other questions? No? Any questions to Fiona? Councillor Harvey. Thank you, uh, Chair. Just want to know if this proposal doesn't, you, um, you, um, you did say that it has a negative effect on surrounding area, but uh, it fits in within the confines of the tennis court itself, and the tennis court itself will not be redeveloped and is being wasted on the land. So, how, why we couldn't really, you know, make it ready for a resident who is deteriorating condition? Okay. So the assessment we have to make in terms of greenbelt policy relates to the impact on openness um, of the entire area. So we view that the existing provision of a tennis court would have a less harmful impact on openness than a permanent new building. Um, whilst we can um, deeply sympathise with the um, applicants' health problems and, and that kind of thing, personal circumstances in this instance, um, the building itself would be there perhaps beyond, well definitely beyond the person's lifetime, beyond the next lifetime and beyond the next lifetime after that. So as planning officers we have to consider the long-term impacts on the designation of the open, the open character of this green belt location. 
and we feel that the existing tennis court has a much less severe impact on that than the proposed building. So that's obviously where we've reached that um, conclusion in the policy terms. So, can I, can I follow that up? So, but you will consider <coughs> special circumstances in relation to health. But this, in this case, this has not been submitted. So, can we make it as a condition if we are in, in line of uh, approval today? Based on the health condition, which has not been submitted at the time of uh, So, the applicant's personal circumstances have not been considered because they weren't presented whilst the draft of the agenda was published. Um, if you wanted those to be considered, we'd ask, have to ask members to consider deferring the scheme today. Mm -hmm. We'd take it away, ask for those special circumstances to be submitted. We'd consider them and obviously present a, a revised report to you potentially at the next meeting. Mm -hmm. Councillor Jones. Thanks, Chair. On page 74, under the Office of Policy D1, the last sentence, which says proposals shall be limited to meet identified local needs, is that a standalone sentence with regard to the that paragraph, or is it part of the paragraph on page seventy four? Um, Sorry, page, sorry, page 74, agenda page 78. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> that one, that one. Yeah. So, policy D1. Is, that, is it D1? Yes. Yeah, so, it's, it's that fact, that sentence. Is that, is that, a sta in that, is that perceived as being a standalone sentence? Or is it related to the rest of the paragraph? It is related to the rest of the paragraph. Um, so, elsewhere in the Green Belt, Housing development will only be acceptable if it involves a change of use of a rural building or subdivision or replacement of an existing dwelling. That change of use of a rural building or the subdivision or replacement of an existing dwelling must also meet the identified local need. However, in terms of the way that's structured, it could be perceived to be a standalone sentence which would then have a completely different connotation to what that would mean. For example, you know, I know, because obviously I live in the area, Pontefract and that and so forth, and I know Aquas very well, and we know that there's a massive shortage of suitable bungalows. And invariably, if a bungalow comes on the market, it's snapped up within a couple of hours. And we know that on a regular basis. So therefore, for somebody who would, is requiring a, you know, a home which is on one level, the ability to actually go out into the market to buy one because there's such a shortage in the area, it's impossible. So therefore, I would, I'm interpreting that sentence in the way that it actually is meeting a local need because there's such a shortage of bungalows. Now maybe I'm just, I'm reading, that's how I'm reading that and interpreting that sentence. Now maybe it needs to be restructured at some later date, but as, as that sentence stands in terms of punctuation and the structure of the sentence, that stands alone. So, and that's my feeling that there's a massive shortage of bungalows. And if this gentleman has got, and clearly I appreciate that the, the points that you just made after uh, the previous sort of questions that he had come from that, but equally, it could well be done under the Disability Discrim Discrimination Act mm -hmm. in terms of the fact that this person has now got disability because of their illness. So there's lots of different issues around this now. So, but having taken that as I am doing, that's why I'm, I'm feeling blind in the way I am at the moment. So that's obviously a great comment. It's obviously a vast sort of interpretation of it, but equally it's still open for interpretation. Thanks, Chair. On the second point, Councillor Jones, I think if members are ultimately minded to not go with the office recommendation to refuse permission and, and look to approve it, um, Alex might want to comment in a minute, but um, Fiona was correct in the interpretation of that planning policy, so I don't think the justification for going with the approval should be to reinterpret the word of the policy. 
If members feel that the proposal itself and the very special circumstances for it is because it's meeting the specific need of the applicant, I think legally that's a safer ground to justify overturning the officer recommendation than to come with a different interpretation of the policy because that would probably be a unsound decision. No problem with that. <laughs> Any further questions? Councillor Scott? Yeah, uh, I agree with uh, Councillor Harvey and Councillor Jones on this with the very, very special circumstances. I've also got another uh, issue where the other side of the, there's the house and there's where the possible bungalow could be built and then at the other side of that there's quite a few houses so to me this is just infill and it's a small, it's, it's a big bungalow but it's not very high. Whereas you could get a two-storey, somebody putting in for a two-storey uh, property or a three-storey when you've got the other side. There's quite a few houses that's been built in people's gardens. And why would we refuse a bungalow in their garden is beyond me, especially when we're looking at very special circumstances through ill health. Because to me, it's, just, it's infill when you look at all the other houses that's been built in people's gardens. Uh, and, and because policy's changed and we're saying no to this, when it's a bungalow in somebody's garden and there's loads of other, there's, there's a lot of other houses that's being built round about. So for me, I'd say defer around the uh, ill health. So I've listened to what you've all had to say and I've got a sense of um, where you might be going with this. Clearly the recommendation is for refusal. Um, if you want to go against that, You'll have to provide adequate reasons as to why you want to depart from that recommendation. Um, personal circumstances are a green belt consideration. Um, personal circumstances on their own are unlikely to amount to very special circumstances to outweigh down to the green belt, but they could. Um, but you've got to consider whether you know enough about those personal circumstances now mm. to attach any weight to that consideration and it, it's not really picked up in the report so just have that in mind. Okay. Oh, I've just, just got a comment about publicity. Um, from the drive, it's not abundantly apparent that this building is in Greenbelt, and the publicity were confined to uh, local neighbours. Um, what, what, what I find is the better Greenbelt applications are publicised, the more objections come in. And because this work weren't made readily available, um, I think that's the reason why there's no objections. Uh, no comments come in because if you look at it, if you look at the side, if you look at the layout, it isn't immediately apparent that it is in Greenbelt. Whereas if it had been advertised well as being in Greenbelt, we find in that area that that would attract a lot more comments. Thank you. Councillor, just to respond. Um, Page 72 of the agenda details the publicity that was carried out. Um, we did publicise by name the notification letter. Site notice was identified as a departure from the development plan, which means that it's in the green belt, uh, advert in the local press and on the council's website. Um, so we did publicise the application by all means that we have available to us. Sorry. It's my concern because in the, in the in the planning statement submitted by, by the applicant, they said that it wasn't in Greenwell. They said that it was adjacent to Greenwell, which were misleading. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I think it's fair to say Thank you, Chair. 
Fiona, just help me about the landscape of this Green Belt border, bordering the Green Belt. And uh, we've established that the tennis court will not be redeveloped and have been permanently left in the current status of downing status. So, would we be able to argue that the bundle actually is going to be enhance the landscape of Green Belt rather than, you know, because to see, it's an eyesore to see the tennis court be there, not used and has not been maintained. Uh, well, in all those years, and not going to be likely to be reused again. So, will that be? Okay. I couldn't advise members to um, suggest that lack of maintenance of the Greenbelt site would be a justified reason to approve dwelling in the Greenbelt. I think you'd come up with a bit of challenge in that regard. Um, the site, obviously, as explained, is, is set down from the road. Um, the tennis court, in my view, and um, obviously members saw it as well. It does really need looking after, but the landscape grounds are well maintained. So I think ultimately you'd, you'd struggle to justify a reason for approval on the basis of the tennis court being in need of winter maintenance. But there's no one else I can add to that. that. That's because the current owner actually do take the proud to actually maintain the, 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 <coughs> the, the area. But this reason why it's supposed to come to that. But in essence, who's going to be living next door to a pot of land or such, land and such for, for years and years, and especially when you're the most of it, doesn't matter where the value is, how the market or the price is. But it is for this person, you know, and, and all the, what we have discussed, discussed in the past half an hour, I think, culminates to, to me that it should be approval instead of a Further questions or comments to Fiona? No? I'll leave the room now. Can we defer it? Regarding I'll approval. Do we not need to defer it to get the word about the about the special needs?
outweigh the substantial harm against it. And in terms of the consistency of decision making, we have to be aware that you will have future applications before you in the green belt for dwellings. And whatever the very special circumstances are, that are potentially what you go with at this site, we have to be careful that they don't get replicated on with us. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, what I mentioned earlier on around the very special circumstances around a, 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 a person's health and also around the other properties that have had properties built in their gardens that's just a few doors down, that's quite a few houses. And to me, that looks like this looks like infill. So could we use them both, where we've got infill and a person's special circumstances, their health? So can we use them both? Thank you, Chair. I do feel like uh, because the owner has been really take extra the effort to maintain the ground, that is why we got the border as well as it, it looked like. But the tennis court sitting in the middle is going to be a detrimental scene for the green belt and it needs to be maintained, need to be looked into for the you know in the future anyway. So we should not view this as a det detrimental effect of the landscape. That's my view. The redevelopment of previously developed land, as it says in the report, is subject to two tests. One, whether the land itself is previously developed, and obviously that is a prize, but because the dwellings are on the tennis court, it can be deemed to be previously developed land. The second part of that test in the MPPF is whether a proposal has a greater impact on openness. Now, officers have come to the conclusion that this proposal has a greater impact on, on the openness of the green land. For that reason, we've said that the proposal is inappropriate development. If members feel that this proposal doesn't have a greater impact on openness, that's for you to decide the committee. But if, if, if that's what you're determining, then it follows that the development itself would be appropriate and you wouldn't need very special circumstances to approve it. But you'd have to have made the decision based on the information that you've got, the plans that you've seen, that the, the site itself is previously developed land and that this particular proposal has no greater impact on openness at this particular site. Sorry, Chair, yeah, it, you exactly explained the point because Council Taylor also mentioned that from the outside of the paper we cannot see because it's much lower this piece of the land, so it will not cause the, 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 the landscape to be, you know, like, um, well, spoiled in a sense, and especially it has not affected the neighbourhood either, so I don't think that it has serious impact on the grown, surrounding areas or the landscape itself, that's my, my take, it should be Jen, I have got a motion to approve this application for the simple reason that I don't think it's any harm to the to green belt. You can't see it from the roadside, you won't be able to see it from surrounding areas of so there's that much land there. There is a lot of land for garden space or whatever you want to do there. Uh, and I don't think it has a, a big impact on the green belt whatsoever. So there's my reasons for um, asking for approval for this application. So we go to the vote. Council member has put approval. Do I have it seconded? In favour? Against? Abstention? Yeah, so that's been kind of something to come from me. So, just to be clear, the reason for the overturn of the officer decision is because members feel that this proposal has no greater impact on openness than the existing development on site. And on that basis, members consider it appropriate development in the green belt. And the 
difficult to see it from anywhere else. It's you know, it's secluded. If that makes any better. No, that's right. In terms of an approval, we will need to have some conditions to impose on the scheme. Are members happy for those, the, the, the final word of those conditions to be delegated to service director in consultation with chair and vice chair? Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And that's our last committee for this week. It's also my last one for the stop, so. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd just like to say thanks to everybody on the committee for sticking with us for this time. Yeah. Whatever it is. Thank you, of course. And I'll see you all sometime next <laughs> year.